Um, hi, everybody. I'm Priya Jmera. I represent the Nudge Center for Social Innovation. Uh, welcome to day two of Churcha. Uh, I wanted to do a small recap on the social innovation track for those who couldn't join us yesterday. Uh, given the multiple parallel tracks at Churcha 2020, we decided that the objective of social innovation track uh, would be to focus on the long term view about the sector and what do we need to do to enable that view. Uh, over the course of these three days, we uh, yesterday we had some very interesting conversations and we will have a lot of uh, conversations today and tomorrow with sector leaders who will come in and talk about uh, their view of where the sector should go uh, with the sole objective of inspiring each one of us to think about, rethink about the social problems that we're working on and to build innovative solutions that are future ready. Uh, with that aim in mind, yesterday we kick-started the social innovation track with an address by Lakshmi Narayan KR, the Chief Endowment Officer at Azim Premji Foundation and a real and a uh, and a dear uh, mentor of ours, uh, uh, Lan Lakshmi Narayan KR or Lan um, has spent time in tech and development sector over the last couple of years and uh, and understands both of these sectors really well. Uh, we then had an anchor session of open spaces for innovation with experts in education like Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratham, uh, experts in health like Sunil Anand, who is the um, CEO of Echo India, uh, experts in livelihood uh, with, with uh, Gayatri Vasudevan, the CEO of LaborNet, and with Lalitesh, who is uh, Katra Dada, who is building technology solutions for next half billion. So all of them came together um, to talk about the role that technology plays, that to talk about the role that community plays, uh, to talk about um, what does the new world or new normal look like from their perspective. Uh, there are some very interesting conversations that happened and we will post the link to that session uh, in the chat box later today. Uh, um, and you can go out, go back, look at that conversation. But a uh, lot of interesting conversation around decentralizing, co-creating with community, as well as upskilling, whether it is for parents, for the education of the child, or frontline health workers. A uh, lot of focus on entrepreneurship, especially focused on uh, women and how do we reduce friction for that. Um, the objective, uh, the the session was pretty bang on on starting to motivate all of us to think of what is the new normal we can create in our work. Uh, so today we want to take this conversation to the next step and talk about what are enablers that need to be in place for ideators, innovators to start building solutions quickly. Uh, one of the biggest one is an ecosystem of players that supports them from media to entrepreneurial infrastructure to funders who believe in experimentation and patient capital. So today we've gathered together a panel that has all of those. I will introduce the moderator of our next panel, Shantanu Ghosh, who will set the context of this panel discussion and then introduce the other panelists. Uh, Shantanu spent three decades in business and finance leadership roles with Genpag, GE, Unilever, PwC. In the first half of his career, he has a finance specialist uh, with the last stint as CFO for GE in India. In 2019, he decided to focus all his energies on the Indian social sector uh, and began mentoring and advising uh, diverse organizations in that sector. He now heads Social Finance India and focuses on creating a multiplier effect uh, by att uh, creating um, uh, or attracting non-philanthropic capital into the sector. Um, creating focus and standardization of outcomes and measurements and, and establishing pay for success models. A few housekeeping rules before I hand it over to Shantanu. Uh, you can um, share your questions for the panelists in the Q&A section below and we will pick as many questions as we can time permitting. Um, those who are watching us on the various live streams, uh, please send your questions on the social innovation channel on Attendify app. Uh, and we will post the link here um, uh, on these various channels and uh, uh, hope to have a really interesting conversation. And it is, uh, the panel is successful if a lot of interesting questions come in so that it helps us drive the direction better. So I'm hoping that you will all send very interesting questions for the panel. Over to you, Shantanu. 
Thank you, Priya. Wonderful. Um, so first, good morning on a Friday, balmy morning, I think, uh, to about the 100 odd people who have already logged in and the number is going up as I can see every second. Um, we have a terrific topic, which is building the innovation ecosystem for the social sector. And I think we couldn't have had a better representative panel uh, from Social Alpha and School, who actually, you know, focus on incubation, uh, to Anuradha from Better India, who focuses on market access and, and communication, to uh, Murugan from Cisco, who focuses on institutionalizing capability and championing that, and to Social Finance India, uh, who's focused on blended finance and therefore scaling up. So we have a large part of the, you know, uh, enablers covered. Uh, through this panel and we hope that over the next you know an hour or so uh, we'll be able to discuss a bunch of stuff regarding both the success as well as the constraints and challenges and the trends in building an uh, innovation ecosystem in India. Um, what I'd like to do now and we're going to make it very interactive we are going to have a couple of polls we obviously uh, encourage all of you to uh, send in your questions we have a mechanism in which the questions will come up we'll try and take as many of them throughout the conversation as we can. Um, with that, let me try and uh, bring the other participants in to talk a little bit about how they think from their organization point of view, they are in this whole area of enabling innovation. Um, so uh, Murugan, if I can request you to start and then we'll just go around. Sure. Thank you, Shantanu. Thank you, Priya. Um, I'm from Cisco and responsible for social innovation uh, at Cisco in India and South Asia. Um, you can look me up on LinkedIn, read all about Cisco. Uh, it's all available in public. Let me try and see if I could bring uh, Eshan Thunu has guided us in terms of the philosophy of what we do um, and try and capture that in a sentence. Um, we essentially support problem solving, right? And hence, we want to find problem solvers. Now, we have a very simple definition of who a problem solver is. A problem solver is someone who innovates like a technologist. We are a technology company, so that's really our focus. Who thinks like an entrepreneur, because that's really the next step. It's not just about innovation. Manoj will talk beautifully about the importance of entrepreneurship. And also acts like a social change agent. So this is really captures the philosophy of what type of organizations we're looking to support someone who innovates like a technologist, thinks like an entrepreneur and acts like a social change agent. So we really kind of over the last five years or so, divided our portfolio into a build and a nurture site. We're looking to create, incubate uh, and accelerate solutions. That's part of the build site. And on the nurture side, you know, we want to support scale and help companies and organizations operate what they, whatever they've innovated. So just a quick introduction from my side and we'll continue the conversation. Here. Okay, great. Anuradha, would you go after this? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Shantanu. And thank you, Priya and the core team for having me. Um, I believe that an innovation is only as good as the number of people who know about it. You might have developed the, the most <clears throat> impactful and the most groundbreaking innovation in the world. But only but if uh, only your wife and dog know about it, it would have served no purpose. Um, it is really important to, uh, uh, you know, really get get the word out, and I believe media plays a very crucial role in the in aiding the discovery and uh, reach uh, of of the innovation and helping it reach its potential as well. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Anuradha Kedia, and I'm co-founder of India's largest impact from, uh, media for impact platform called the Better India. At the Better India, we have taken uh, innovators who were struggling and on the brink of bankruptcy and made them millionaires within a couple of days. Uh, we've taken innovators glo global um, and become voice to become voices of influence in international organizations. We've enabled mass adoption of social innovations, uh, helping people at the bottom of the pyramid learn about it and, and be able to use various ways in which they can just use uh, technology for good. Uh, we've partnered with Niti Aayog and Atal Innovation Mission to take student innovations from pro prototype to market. We've highlighted grassroots innovations so that thousands of farmers uh, can adopt low cost inventions 
to ease their efforts and, and help them in their daily lives, and so much more. The way I see it, media plays a multi-pronged role as an enabler for social innovation. One, it accords visibility and recognition to the innovator, really helping him tap into a lot of different segments, which would otherwise be uh, possibly impossible for them to uh, reach out to. Secondly, it opens up market linkages, makes, the, uh, makes consumers and even, invent, uh, even donors and investors aware of the inventions and innovations in the first place, so that access to funding and access to markets become a possibility for the innovators. Thirdly, by putting the spotlight on innovations, uh, it inspires generation after generation of new innovators who get inspired by, the, uh, by an idea and improve upon it or even develop something much better. Fourthly, it gives impetus to the entire uh, sector and continue to develop and build the ecosystem by connecting all the stakeholders and bringing them together. In this way, uh, the Better India and uh, we as, as an impact platform believe that storytelling and media uh, helps take innovations from, from uh, scratch or from a very small uh, place to, to the world at large. So I'm happy to be part of this panel and contribute uh, uh, in, in, in whatever way I can to help in, uh, talk about the role of media and communication in the world of social innovation. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Uh, Santosh, how about you? Thanks, Shantanu. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Santosh Ramdas. I uh, work in the investments team at the Skoll Foundation. Um, where I have two roles. One is I help anchor our mission investing practice. Um, I also work with local uh, intermediaries and ecosystem builders in supporting that. So those are my two functions. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Skoll's mission is to uh, connect, celebrate, and fund social entrepreneurs around the world uh, who are solving the world's most pressing problems. Uh, we've been doing that for the past two decades now. Um, Jeff Skoll got really excited about social entrepreneurs early in this uh, kind of revolution. And ever since then, we've been relentlessly committed uh, to doing that. And uh, the biggest way we do that is through the School Award for Social Entrepreneurship, which we give out every year. Um, and I do want to say that just in terms of innovation ecosystems, a lot of our work is uh, dependent on these local powerful uh, places where social entrepreneurs start their work um, and start building organizations. Um, and we wouldn't be able to come in and fund a lot of this if these ecosystems didn't exist. We've been ourselves an ecosystem builder globally, but that being said, we are a US-based private foundation that funds globally. And the role of local actors is increasingly becoming really powerful because all change is happening locally. Um, and this is something we're really excited about. And that's part of the reason why even this discussion about innovation ecosystems, both globally and locally is, is very relevant to us uh, and I'm excited to represent. And I'm happy to talk about some of the challenges and successes in this, uh, but I'll leave it brief for the introduction part. Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Santosh. So taking on your cue on local actors, let me bring in Manoj. Um, and Manoj, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Shantanu. Hello, everyone. Uh, at Social Alpha, we are on a mission to create economic growth, social justice, and climate change using the power of entrepreneurship and new market-creating innovations, or which we also call social innovation. Right? So what actually we do, we, we work with private sector, public sector, regulators, NGOs, civil society players, actual customers and consumers in understanding and curating the problem statements in some of the neglected areas and build a thesis around that and then search for innovators and entrepreneurs who have potential solutions for these problems. So we search for them, we help them build their product, uh, help them pilot their solutions, help them build their dream companies, invest in them and take them to market. So it's a vertically integrated idea to market access uh, architecture that allows uh, us to support our innovators throughout their go to market journey. Thank you, Manoj. And just to round up the introductions in our social finance India, we are a financial intermediary, uh, not for profit focused on scaling up innovative solutions and impact in the development area. And the way we do that is really through blended finance and structuring programs, which are highly outcome focused and which uses a mix of different types of capital 
to deliver that outcome. Um, we, we today, uh, actually in the evening, there is a separate session on blended finance. So we are not going to spend too much time on specifically on that, but it is an important element of scaling up any innovation um, that takes, uh, you know, that gets incubated by people like Skoll and, and uh, Social Alpha and Cisco, and then gets publicized by Better, Better India, and then really needs a lot of blended <clears throat> capital, a lot of scale up. Uh, with that, let me uh, request Priya to do the first poll uh, in terms of the audience uh, right now, because that will help us understand a little bit of the demographics of the audience. Yeah. And while that is happening, uh, let me tee up the next topic for discussion. Um, and Manoj, this time maybe we will reverse the batting order a little bit and, and ask you to go first uh, once we get the results of the poll. And the topic of the discussion is that while we are calling this building the innovation ecosystem. It's not as if innovation hasn't been happening. I think there are some outstanding stories of uh, innovation which has happened, outstanding stories of entrepreneurship which have taken that innovation to scale. And it would be great to have a couple of examples from each one of you on what you've seen as success and what you, have, what you think contributed to that success. Um, so Manoj, if I can request you to go first, maybe the moment we sort of um, get the results of the poll. Okay. I'm told we can't vote for this. So we'll have to just wait for the results. Yeah, we'll give it another few seconds. Uh, yeah. And we'll publish the results later. So Manoj, you can get started and uh, we will publish the results later. Okay. So uh, yeah, uh, Shantanu, thanks for bringing that topic up because social innovation is not something new, right? People uh, have been creating uh, uh, innovations and creating impact. Uh, let me let me give you examples from our own portfolio, right? Uh, and I'm picking up from three different sectors. We have we have a startup in our portfolio that built world's first liquid helium free portable MRI machine, which is going through currently going through the clinical trials. Uh, the beauty of this, uh, you know, completely indigenous, make in India. MRI machine is, it reduces the cost of MRI scan uh, to 25 to 30% of what it is today, right? Now, why it's important? Because you have suddenly created a new market, right? A lot of people who do not have access to MRI scan because of the cost in, involved and access involved, right? So it addresses both affordability as well as accessibility and, and allows us to reach out to smaller towns, potentially on a mobile truck, right, to provide MRI scan. This is one example. The other example is a, is a very famous company now called Pool. It's based in Kanpur, and they collect flowers from temples and other religious establishments and convert it into several products. And they have innovated now, and their latest product is a biodegradable thermocol replacement. That, that's huge social and relative environmental impact. We have another company in Bangalore uh, called Hasirudala that organizes waste pickers and collects waste from the place where waste is originated and manages the entire supply chain of waste using technology and logistics. And this company has in four years uh, built a powerful portfolio, has been growing faster than a large number of mainstream commercial startups and has created impact in the livelihoods of waste pickers, which are, you know, some of the most, uh, you know, I would say poorest of the poor people. But the most interesting thing in this lockdown for the last 50, 50 plus days, they have not missed their service a single day, right? So these are three completely different stories from three different sectors. And each one of this company has done innovation in one way or other to make lives of everybody better and also create products which are affordable, accessible, and have a better user experience. And Manoj, if I can just follow up with that with you only, in terms of if you think of those three very different examples, and they were outstanding examples, what are a couple of common themes that you see there? You know, in terms yeah. of either ecosystem or in yeah. terms of the way people yeah. approach it, what, what's the commonality? The common theme among these three and the entire, we have about 100 plus 
companies in our portfolio and we have invested in 35 out, out of these one common element among all these 35 watt companies where we have invested is each one of the founder innovator is an entrepreneur and that's the differentiating factor right there are a lot of innovations out there in the market you talk to any university any research center you will see hundreds of patents and ips which have never gone to market entrepreneurs are the people who take these ideas and innovation from lab to market and innovators who are also entrepreneurs are wonderful and most of the time we see that this especially in the social innovation space uh, innovators who are also entrepreneurs are the people who actually make it to that wonderful thanks santosh if i can ask you to come in uh, and reflect your experiences and your examples um, with manojis from what you have seen in your portfolio yeah um well i mean i think i'm i kind of could reflect a little bit more at the ecosystem level and what's happening which is interesting um as um as promising kind of developments and positive developments um i think one thing that we are definitely seeing is that there's a proliferation of uh, sector building um so i think 15 20 years ago the idea of uh, a social sector innovation ecosystem was somewhat of radical idea i mean of course i do want to give respects to folks like uh pradhan and the dan foundation and of course the microfinance movement these are all obviously examples of it but um in the version that we are seeing now which is entrepreneurially driven uh, by organizations that are either raising startup capital or venture like nonprofit money uh, that ecosystem was somewhat new uh, and you know it, it started off as a social entrepreneurship movement uh, it was it was relatively new even 15 years ago but now it's fairly distributed not one single entity holds it every country has a different i mean india is probably one of the more mature ones but every place in the world has it that's remarkable right i mean nobody orchestrated this it's like the idea of an innovation ecosystem is not like planting a garden it's like a forest you just have to create the right environment and it will grow or not grow and the social entrepreneurship ecosystem globally is at a state where it's incredibly mature uh and i think in many ways india leads the example of what's happened so that's really promising for somebody like skol foundation who's who's really excited about it the second thing we're seeing which is also really exciting is we're seeing startups organizations that are building a systems lens from right in the beginning you know a lot of the jokes in the back in the day used to be if you long if you long enough in the social sector is that we we are a sector full of successful pilots right but the, that's that's the truth um but right now we're starting uh, archetypes of organizations that are designing for scale right from the start uh, and many of them have in their dna from day one working with a larger system whether it's working with the government or the private sector that's built in it's not something that is an afterthought uh, one of our school awardees this year is an organization called arman um they are a maternal health provider which is uh, through mobile based uh, service delivery um and again one of their early pilots was actually in partnership with the government um and rolling it out to like 2 million asha workers around the country so that kind of design is not radical and in fact i think it kind of becomes fundamental to think about how do you um how do you design and that i think is also really promising because then we can bridge this gap between innovation and scale more rapidly so i think those are the true kind of really exciting things that we're seeing which puts us in a place of real optimism around the ecosystem that are getting built perfect thank you santosh um you know bringing on that whole concept of you know system lens um anurada as you have looked at a bunch of these stories and you go and really find out stories which are hidden um how do you reflect on that aspect of system lens versus you know an interesting pilot which is done at a small scale and never can sort of grow what's what's been your experience in that that's a very interesting um, question shantanu so the way we see it i mean if we look at our you know if we call it our portfolio we have thousands of companies in our portfolio right we, these are all the companies with uh, you know innovations and entrepreneurs that we've covered and we've helped them get to a scale right so when uh, what we see is uh, you know you know people who come uh, and i and i really you know uh, believe what uh, manoj said there's there's a certain amount of a uh, push or uh, you know a uh, a uh, uh, certain momentum that can be given to any innovation for it to reach uh, for, for it to go from a small scale to reach a certain size and an impact but uh, after that it it really has to be the entrepreneurs uh, own efforts and genes and a lot of other uh, you know uh, factors in the ecosystem that that take it to the next level right so when we look at uh, you know i i can give you an example of of someone from uh, of of 
of somebody from one of our stories who who not only reached a local uh, you know level success but a really global level success and it's really interesting how both of these happen simultaneously and and it's it's important to see the kind of uh, you know, amplification that can happen when when a, an entrepreneur's or an innovator's story is told the right way, right? It is, it's a system that kicks in. It's 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 the entire ecosystem where you see uh, government taking notice, you see uh, investors and donors taking notice, you see potential customers taking notice, and you see an entire uh, international body taking notice, right? So you don't, you just don't know from where uh, support and you know, collaboration and all kinds of uh, stakeholders are going to come out and support this this innovation. So there was there is a doctor who had innovated, uh, you know, a voice processor's device, uh, which is uh, I, I see Manoja, you know, nodding in uh, uh, recognition. So it this is a device that is used to to give cancer patients or patients who have lost their voice after uh, a surgery. Uh, the, you know, uh, access to uh, basically be able to speak and and uh, develop their uh, capabilities back. And typically, this this was imported in India. It costs uh, anywhere between fifteen to thirty thousand rupees. Um, and uh, what the doctor did was actually invent a, a, a device that costs only fifty rupees. Now, just imagine the scale of that uh, impact because. Uh, you know, you have you have every uh, you know every person from across uh, social uh, uh, sec sections who who need this device, uh, but it was accessible only to a select few. Right now, with this device, he made it accessible to millions. And what you would assume is yes, a story told in a uh, in a digital platform will probably reach. Uh, you know, uh, a few people who are, uh, you know, the urban tech savvy sort of uh, an audience. But what it happened immediately after we ran the story uh, was was that millions, I mean, hundreds and thousands of people actually queued up and started reaching out to him. And these were people like, you know, uh, watchmen, uh, you know, watchmen, what we call it, uh, security personnel or uh, house helpers and every sort of person, daily wage uh, laborers who started reaching out to him and saying, I need that device, you know, how, how can I get access to that? And what happened on the other side is that governments started taking notice. In fact, he was called by the Obama administration to come and speak uh, and be a part of uh, the health administration and also WHO to fight the tobacco um, um, sort of lobby and and talk about the uh, ill effects uh, of of tobacco on on uh, you know relating to cancer. So the what really happens is and I can go on and on about so many such uh, success stories, right? But what happens is really being able to take an innovation. I mean. Just making an innovation is one part of it, right? But after that, you really have to be able to tell that story, to be able to take that to millions of people, and then really see how things pan out. There would be support coming, I mean, the, the entire system comes together and, and helps out, but there's also so many different parameters that, that help catalyze and, and take that innovation from, from, from the hands of the innovator to the millions of people who need it, to governments who can actually help uh, amplify it much further, to international bodies and e everyone else who can really uh, build that ecosystem all together. So I hope that answer answers your question, Shantanu. But if you'd like to yeah. specify for me to uh, specify something else, happy to do that. No, I think each 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 of the conversation is actually a different aspect of you know many different uh, facets of innovation. And in fact, there's a very interesting question. So as Murugan as I. Uh, so thanks, Brother Mugan. As I invite you to talk about it, I'm going to throw this question up. Please feel free to answer, and I'll also request the other panelists to answer if they want to. Which is the question on what what is the role of micro niche entrepreneurs? Is scale the only defining factor of innovation, or is it necessary for an innovation to be successful? So that's one of the questions. But Mugan, go ahead and and give your perspective, and then we can discuss that question. Whoever wants to go for it. Yeah, it's a beautiful question. Uh, and, and it really uh, captures the conflict that uh, that an innovator has. Is do I have to innovate for India scale to begin with? So let me take a step back. I have a couple of comments. 
uh, one of our portfolio organizations wouldn't be able to do their job today if not for Zoom. So is Zoom a social innovation tool? Another one of India's largest organizations, very well established, Goonj, I was talking to Anshu and he was saying, the only way he stays in touch with his team today is by WhatsApp, right? So is WhatsApp a social innovation that is leveraging? So I think we want to make sure that we really think about what is innovation? Sometimes it's process, sometimes it's product, sometimes it's business models. And really, you know, not get caught up on, you know, trying to use drones or AIs and 5G and all those things. Is really, if you really think of a better way of doing whatever is happening today, that is innovation. I have a couple of good examples, Shankar, I'll share that. If you don't mind, I'll put up a couple of slides with pictures to ex explain that. But I also want to make a point here that innovation, what we have seen is uh, we have about 30% of our portfolio are new kind of zero to five year old organizations, uh, really kind of transforming how different things are being done in this sector. But the other 70% of the portfolio are established organizations. Some of the most disruptive innovations we are seeing are from organizations that are 20 years old. One of the organizations, Shikshana, is really thinking about customized learning at every student level at 30 lakh, 3 million students in Karnataka, each one getting different homework, different classwork, different you know, messages to the parents, le leveraging digital. This even Nordic, Scandinavian countries haven't gotten to this level of customized learning at this type of scale. So I think there are, I want to make a point that it is not just startups which are innovating, but also large organizations, established organizations are innovating at scale that we've never seen before. Let me just share a couple of examples. Uh, and you know, I'll just bring, uh, bring this up a little bit, if you don't mind, just give me a minute. All right, so we all know uh, the right to education, section 121C, that gives 25% seats access to economically legal sections of society. Now, when we met this organization in this action, it was about four years ago, they were very new. They only had a little bit of money from a, from a US-based uh, foundation. Uh, and they were doing, you know, feet on the street model in Delhi, trying to get Delhi to adopt uh, and implement this policy. They were a policy do tank, right? Because that, that's what they called themselves at that time. And we, you know, had a quick chat conversation. Hey, you're doing this great job in Delhi. This answer to that question on micro level innovation, uh, Shantanu, one of the uh, uh, attendees have asked, this is micro level innovation, right? Really, Tarun from Indus Action trying to change how a very small, smallest state probably in India does this poll implementation, this policy. None of the states were implementing RTE at that time. And when we had the conversation with him, we just said, put in a thought, do his head. Hey, Tarun, you're really passionate about this. Would you want to look at how do you want to scale this across 29 states and all the union territories? And he said, well, I'm not there yet. Let me just do this with Delhi. Nine months later, came back to us and he said, look, I think we really need to do this at scale. And that's where, you know, back to the philosophy of what we do is he had an innovation and then he added the technology component. So he brought in a chief technology officer. He could innovate like a technologist. He was able to think like an entrepreneur, which is where, you know, if you really want to make that leap and it's not mandatory to the questioner, we ask the question, but if you are really passionate about that change, and if you build an open ecosystem, it will automatically scale. Now, the other ex next example also shows that. So what's happening here in this picture is the RTE lottery in Raipur. And this used to be a completely opaque process where the director of education used to come out and say, these are the 100 people who get into the school. Right? And this is, this is the allocation. Now here you see parents, government, all looking at the computer and it runs its algorithm and spits out a name. They're all happy about what is happening. It's transparency built into the process, innovation using technology, and it's now running in 18 states in India, less than four years. Another key point here is you don't have to be a large organization to make a massive change in the government operations. This is an organization we, we kind of underwrite. So when we support in this action, we under underwrite all of their MOUs and the SOWs that they sign with the government. So the government knows that Cisco is backing this young organization. They feel comfortable. We help them with technology, mentoring, and all of the mm. other things. Then they're able to make that, make that big leap. And now they're impacting 2 million students 
families across India, 18 states in India. Good example of a young organization now quickly scaling, did not have scale in mind after the questionnaire, but really now automatically scaling because what they've built enables them to scale. Right? Uh, I turn the second example. This is how we all used to read books. Book gets written, published, read to a bunch of students. The students then get it from the library, read it, return it. That was what used to happen. Very traditional way of how we all read books. Very traditional industry too. This is not something you say, well, what are you, how are you going to innovate on this at social scale? Now, here's what Pratham Books has done with Story Weaver. Now, that book, Who's on the VS Map, which is only published in one language, is now translated into about 16 languages, including some tribal languages. And that's because what they've built, the innovation platform is open source. The illustrations are all open source. The text, you can change, you can take Rohan Jahid Giridhar's book, completely change it, Poonam changed it to Hindi, Rajesh put it in Gandhi, you know, Jui did it in Marathi. If you build a platform that enables others to collaborate, then you really, you don't have to worry about scale. Others will take care of scale for you, right? Now this book is available in so many languages. Not only that, someone's put it up on YouTube, right? So you can listen to the book on YouTube or you can do a dial a missed, a missed call, leave a missed call to a number and someone will call you and, you know, it's an automated voice will read that book for you. So these are really, you know, what used to be just a book is now transformed into so many channels. That's not because of what Story Weaver or Pratham Book themselves did, but what they put in place as a platform that enabled others to innovate on that. So I hope this answers not just the question, uh, you know, from the, uh, from the audience, but also in terms of generally what innovation could be, small companies, very well established companies, and how they can look at social innovation at scale. No, I think they were great examples, uh, Murugan. Would anyone else want to address that question of niche and small versus scale up? Go ahead, Manoj. Yeah, so that's a great example, Murugan. Thanks for that. Uh, see, a lot of times uh, in, in conversations, everybody assumes that it's scale means the way we historically thought about it, scale, that large scale, linear, you know, growth, like big organizations, right? Some of the successful examples like Akshya Patra, right? But the scale can also be replication, right? You have successful stories, successful business models in a village or a, in a small hyper-local environment. And, it, and you have a standard models for replication and other people can take them out to the market, right? So that's also scale. Scale could be thousand entrepreneurs working on one platform, right? So replication as a scale is very powerful in social innovation in this space, which needs to, we should not forget about the importance of that. Any, anyone else wants to add to that? Manoj, that was a great sum. Uh, great concept of replication brought in there. Um, which actually brings me to the next question. Shatana, before, sorry, if I might just add, I think um, ahead, on, the, on that note of scale, I think one of the things that we're noticing now is that, um, you know, uh, this this archetype of an organization used to be that the larger you are in terms of budgets and size, the more your impact is. Um, but organizations that are really smart about scale, especially nonprofits that we are seeing, um, are recognizing that for them to influence larger systems, they need to be invisible and they need to be smaller and nimble. It's putting their voice behind other people. So in that sense, uh, the quieter you are, the more niche you are, it's actually better. Um, we recently gave a school award to an organization in the US that's trying to influence the US electoral system. Uh, they have a fairly national reach. Uh, and believe it or not, their total number of staff is 24. Um, and they can do that because often they don't go out forward as their name. They put other people forward. And I think that's something interesting for us to think about in the ecosystem in India too. I think a lot of our growth in India has been these massive, large scaled up organizations, but redefining scale a little bit. I think it invokes, that question invokes that answer in terms of how do we think about new archetypes. Yeah, thanks, Antosh. And actually, that will lead to the next topic I want to tee up. But before that, let me ask Priya, uh, do we have the results of the poll which we can show or how do you want I to do that? Show. Yeah. Okay. okay. Which of this describes you best? So I think we have a mix of people who are already working in the nonprofit sector or playing a role of an enabler, but we also have some very interesting mix of people who are trying to learn about the development sector or exploring working in the development sector. 
Actually, I think that's a very, very interesting and, um, and an encouraging trend that we have 20% people who are actually exploring working in this sector. Um, and, I, and, you know, having been a crossover recently, I cannot say how many more of, uh, of such people we need uh, for to come into that sector. But let me go back to the, uh, to the point that was getting teed up earlier, which is this concept of how do you think of scale beyond just one organization adding more number of people, more number of states, more number of districts and doing the same thing in more places, which therefore goes to the point of building scalable platforms and, and the ecosystem, which can leverage of that platform. And in, in keeping in line with the topic of this conversation, which is building the innovation ecosystem, what is your sense of the Indian model in terms of scalable platforms or open platforms for collaboration, where you can actually do the replication that Manoj talked about or be invisible as Santosh talked about, um, or, you know, borrowing of good ideas, you don't, the one person doesn't need to scale, but the idea needs to scale. So how are we in India in terms of our enabling ecosystem? Uh, what's your assessment? Or rather, maybe if you want to just go ahead and then we'll get others in. Sure, Shantanu. I think that's a, that's a question uh, very close to my heart because what we see uh, almost every day and almost with every story that we put out is really uh, uh, you know the 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 urge that people have for replication you know i mean every story that we write and and the way we also write is in a way that is very objective we try and talk about the innovation or or the initiative uh, describe how it works how the uh, you know innovator went about it and things like that so our purpose is more on the how things happen rather than you know just 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 looking at it as a very human centric story to inspire more and more people to take it up to see how easy it is to actually replicate to to see how easy it is uh, to to really do something that this person has done or make a difference in that way uh, with with limited resources and with whatever constraints that you have right it doesn't need a superhuman to do to do what they did it's it's just a regular person who did that so what we see with every story is is hundreds of people or thousands of people reaching out uh, reaching back to us and saying, you know, can you connect us? How can we reach out to them? How can we, uh, you know, we want to do something similar in our neighborhoods or our communities, um, things like that, right? So if we write about, uh, for instance, we write about the steps being taken in one apartment complex in, uh, you know, in, in a city of Bangalore, uh, about how perhaps they're, they're managing their uh, solid waste or how they are, you know, going green, or this, the, the innovative steps that they take, we have at least, you know, 100 other apartments from across the country who reach out to us and say, uh, you know, we, we really want to do something similar. We, we are inspired by what we need. Um, similarly, it happens. So replication seems to be a great way. And, and that's something that we've seen right from the early days of the Better India, uh, where we had to start putting out contact details because we were inundated with mails and messages asking us to connect uh, with with the people, with the change makers or the innovators. There's a huge need. I mean, uh, you know, with 1.3 billion people, one initiative in one corner of the country uh, really does not solve the problem, right? And the and I think the point you're making, sorry if I, if I uh, come in there, I think the point you're making is your platform is actually almost a th you know, it, it, it encourages that replication. That's what it's a, it's a, pet, it's a petri dish for, uh, right. you know, to, to learn about new things and new ideas out there. And okay. what I'm talking, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it's, it's really seems to be a need among people to come back and say, I want to do something mm -hmm. similar. People are not happy to just read a story and go away, but they actually want to do something similar in whatever way that they can in their communities and in their homes or wherever they can replicate that idea. So, sure. so yeah. you, you have created a platform which, which allows replication of ideas and stories. Now, um, I'll ask the others, where did, do you think we have enough platforms which also allows replication of technology, replication of, you know, market access and stuff like that? And for example, just to, give, just to throw this out, you know what the Nilagini Foundation is trying to do on education, which is create an open source platform where a bunch of different types of education can go in, whether it's, you know, the X step model and stuff like that. Do we think we have enough of that or... And Santosh, it would be great to hear from you as to what can we learn from, what can, where can India learn from on that particular piece. So 
um, Murugan, Manoj, why don't we go ahead with India and then Santosh, if you can come in to talk about mm -hmm. where we can learn from. You want me to start first? Sure, Murugan. Manoj, go ahead. So, you know, th there are three platforms that we conceive, uh, you know, and we believe that, you know, they need to be built and we have been working on that. Uh, uh, let me start with, with the ecosystem builders themselves, right? This whole space needs to be hyper collaborative, right? Which effectively means that multiple ecosystem players, whether they are investors, incubators, academic institutions, uh, non-profits, they need to work in a non-competing, hyper collaborative platform, which is transparent and trusted, right? Then only you can have multiple innovations uh, being shared on a platform without any fear of you know, getting brownie points around, around, you know, who did what, right? That, that whole problem is a big problem today. And I'll give you an example. Recently, when the COVID started, uh, at least 10 institutions came together to launch a COVID accelerator, uh, Social Alpha, CCAM, PATH, IHF, ACT, uh, instead of doing their own in accelerators in silos. So COVID was a good, you know, I would say nudge to all the people to, to work together and, and, and build this platform. The two other things. One is uh, social innovation, at, and I'm saying this based on our experience, uh, there are always new market creators, right? So when you build a more affordable diagnostic device, you are creating a new market, right? Uh, uh, as Morgan was mentioning about Zoom and WhatsApp, uh, you know, what is happening? WhatsApp is actually whatever was the intent to develop WhatsApp, but it has created a new market, right? So a large number of consumers and customers do not consume products and services because they are either not as affordable or accessible or they don't like the user experience, right? So any innovation that changes this creates new market. So this new market creating nature of innovation has to be recognized. And then the last bit is the capital and, and that's your area, Shantanu. But see what happened, the mainstream capital for mainstream innovation is very symmetric, right? Historically, we have all been taught uh, in, in the practice of finance and capital market that risk and return have to be commensurate with each other, right? So you get a return adjusted to a risk you are taking. Unfortunately, this whole new market creating social innovation space is asymmetric on that part, right? Your return in pure financial term may not be commensurate with the risk you are taking. Correct. Whether it will be low or high, you don't know because it's unknown. It could be extremely volatile. It could be high as well, right? But at Oops, I think we've got a connectivity problem with Manoj. So maybe while he just comes <coughs> back, um, uh, let, me, let me add on to what Manoj is saying. I think it's very important and, and one of the fundamental principles in blended finance is how do you add a third dimension to the risk and return equation, which is impact. And uh, it's not an easy answer because like all of us know, the moment you introduce a third variable in an equation, the answers are much more than two variables, right? You don't get a definitive answer. But it is an important variable that has been introduced and that's actually been uh, growing pretty well over the last few years. In fact, um, just to give you a couple of data points, you know, just blended finance today, the, the total commitment is $132 billion. Um, if you look at last 10 years, the number of transactions have gone up by eight times. So it's not, I mean, this is globally and India is roughly about 15% of transactions. So it's not as if it's a, it's a foreign concept. It's catching up. Uh, with that impact lens. Now, is it as easy to sort of, you know, benchmark it like a debt fund, use a sovereign debt fund is X percentage return. If you have something else, triple A's, this thing, it's not because it's three dimensions. It produces multiple results. Sorry, Manoj, because you got disconnected. I was feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to complete. I think, I don't know where did I drop, but what I was trying to say that to, to create new markets, right. Or to create, market for social innovation, you need a completely new category of capital, a capital that is willing to take extraordinary large risk and is willing to live with the uncertainty of this high risk and is patient enough to remain invested for a very long term or even some, in some cases perpetually, right? And that is where this whole concept of your blended finance, mixing philanthropic long-term patient capital with the market capital is extremely, extremely important. 
right? So basically, I'm talking about three areas: the market creating innovation, and how do you share them? The new category of capital that the world needs right now, and an a hyper transparent, trusted, and collaborative platform for ecosystem builders, which is non-competitive. Perfect, Morgan. Why don't you add to that? Yeah. From your perspective, let, let me add a, a different perspective on the replication platform because you know uh, Manoj and uh, Santosh can talk a lot about the financial piece and the innovation piece. Let's not forget the largest replication platform that exists in India is the government, right? Uh, that that's it. Right? The reason why uh, so Shantanu you brought up Xstep, Xstep is the largest replication platform for education in India, not because it came from Nilkani philanthropies, but because it became Diksha in the Ministry of Human Resources Development, and they adopted Absolutely. it, and that's why it is the largest replication platform for education. And what we do is you know, for example, what we adopted uh, Exitep when it was, you know, uh, in the early days, three years, four years ago, is we pivoted to, or we ensured that all of our education investments, if someone's creating content, three years ago, we said, you got to create content that will work with Diksha platform when it comes up, right? So, in fact, one of the first set of content for education that was created by, on Exitep was the, uh, uh, the, uh, content we created with Akshara Foundation on Math, which is now one of the five uh, recommended, uh, you know, uh, uh, contents on Xstep, on Diksha itself. So the replication of the government is very important angle and I'll give you, build on the same example of Indus Action, right? Uh, Indus Action, when we walk into the state government with the Indus Action platform to help the government implement the RTE policy, across the state. We walk in with an exit clause because we don't want to keep feeding that. This answers both the scale question and the replication question. In three years, we tell the government that we will build capacity. We will put in the hardware, software, platform, train your people, train NIC, whatever is required. But in three years, the MOU says, in this action and Cisco will exit. The Department of Education and NIC in that state will run this on their own. So, and that is really what creates that sustainable, replicable solution. So I just want to leave that out there as, you know, for those in the audience who are thinking of solutions, don't forget the largest application platform we have in India is the government. Yeah, and, and actually coming to think of that, if you just think of the Jam Trinity, right? Uh, without that, most of the innovation replication in many ways will not be even possible. So actually, you're exactly right that we should not underplay the government's role. It's usually a misconception yeah. that many of us have, which says that we have to do it despite or in spite of the government. Actually, it's not true. No, no. Actually, uh, this reminds me of a uh, nice, this trinity that Nandan Nilekani mentions. Sarkar, Bajar, Samaj, right? The market, the government and the society. These are the three vertex of this, you know, action. You can't ignore either of them. Right. Santosh, any quick comments from you before I go on to the next poll? Because that's going to be a crucial question we're going to ask the audience. Yeah, um, just a couple of things. I mean, one, um, Shantan, you were kind of asking me to bring a global perspective. I would say first thing that India, I'm still, I mean, I think we're, we're very bullish on India in terms of the maturity of the ecosystem that we've built. And uh, it's not one actor. I think it's all of us in this call, but it's also tons of other people who are like committed to it. And I think one of the things that's acknowledgeable about us as a society is that there's always been a sense of collective problem solving uh, that comes from our Gandhian roots. But I think that is always reflective in the way Manoj was talking about our collaborative culture or the way it has built into these open ecosystems that we are pioneering in the world, right? Um, and there are tenets of it, all of it. I mean, today it's all tech, but if you go back and look at the SSG movement, you know, it started off as a spark with like one or two organizations. I think Myrada was one of the ones. And then it's just spread across. Nobody started like it was it was it was essentially an offline open ecosystem. Right. And then, you know, today we're kind of making tech enabled. So there's there's a lot of history there. We should acknowledge it um, and not just, you know, borrow from Western ideas. I think that's one thing. The other is I think the maturity of the ecosystem. One of the things I would say is, you know, for a few years, we've been trying to launch a nonprofit seed fund. The first of its kind, like a seed fund that supports early stage nonprofits specifically. Um, again, getting it off the ground elsewhere in the world has been incredibly hard, but India has got the first one up and running with Series N uh, with a nudge. So I think those kinds of examples are, are indicative. 
where we can do a lot more work, where we see a, a different kind of perspective is the innovation that is kind of working in partnership with the government. Um, at the central level, I think there's a lot of appetite to work with social entrepreneurs to replicate ideas, but I think we need to see a lot more local partnerships where the government is a biggest accelerator of ideas. And there's a huge opportunity for us to build the capacity of the public sector to borrow, you know, kind of collaborate more seamlessly with, with innovators. Because um, we're moving at a very fast pace and how do we enable that to happen is an area where I think this ecosystem would become even more robust in the country is, is my guess. Wonderful. So with that, let's just take a quick um, uh, poll because I think the next question which the poll is asking is really the constraints um, to innovation. And I think it's important for us to understand what the audience feel are const constraints. And while that will happen, so Priya, can I request the poll to happen on that? Yeah, the poll is live. It's on the screen now. Okay. So while that's happening and the questions come up, why don't we start with uh, our own perceptions of that? Um, and maybe Anuradha, if you, if you want to go first, um, if you had to pick out three of the top um, constraints or impediments that you see in India in terms of innovation scaling up um, or innovations happening at a rapid pace, what are those three for you? I think uh, from our experience, the kind of uh, constraints that we've seen um, are largely, you know, one is, I think, uh, from, from, from coming from the communication side. And uh, I, I think uh, one is that most innovators in India are not great communicators. You know, they're not able to tell the story really well. And that, that really, uh, in a lot of cases, makes or breaks an idea. You know, it, it really uh, curtails how far or how, how big a success that can be if the innovator is not able to really, uh, I mean, some of the most successful innovations we've seen and coming out of the Better India has been uh, where the innovators have been able to tell their stories really well. So that's, that's an unfortunate, uh, sometimes a personal constraint that innovators themselves uh, have and they're not able to scale up. Uh, the second part is um, when, when, when they're not very savvy in terms of collaborations, right? Sometimes there are a lot of missed opportunities, even when people are willing to collaborate or they reach out to them, you know, uh, it, it could also be a personal uh, sort of a bias, but sometimes innovators are not able to take that leap uh, in, in, and, and, and uh, welcome partnerships, whether it's with the government, whether it's with other innovators or, or you know, uh, it could be corporate or so many different ways uh, that collaborators come knocking or support comes knocking and they're not able to kind of capitalize on that and, and take their innovations to the next stage. I think the third main constraint that we've seen is, is in some ways, uh, you know, thinking big, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, uh, a constraint that innovators and, you know, even we talk to a lot of them, right? We, we try to look at the bigger picture, like how, who all can this impact, right? And sometimes we find that the innovators themselves have, have a very small, uh, you know, uh, impact set in their mind where they think, yes, this, this, is, uh, this is who it can, you know, benefit. But when we look at that innovation or, you know, our larger audience looks at the innovation, there are so many new possibilities that open up that the innovator uh, himself or herself had never imagined, right? And sometimes they are not, they might not be able to uh, accept that or push themselves to, to, to reach out to that lar larger uh, impact set. So, sometimes they constrain the outcomes that can uh, be possible uh, with their innovations just by not thinking big enough or not um, pushing the limits or understanding the complete potential. So these are some of the uh, the, the, the uh, you know, and, and this is, these are mostly what I'm talking about are largely human focused, but there are so many other system generated uh, constraints that come in sometimes, you know, access to you know, governments or access to funding is extremely difficult, especially when we've, we've seen this with grassroots innovations, uh, which, which were brilliant, which, which had great impact and great potential, but access to funding just seemed uh, uh, a far cry for them. So, so uh, yeah. You the three sort of, you know, the first three points that you mentioned, which are really about approach and mindset. And I think those are very, very valid points. 
I want to actually bring in one of the question aspect here and then go to Murugan because he represents tech. Because yeah. Cisco is obviously synonymous. And the question here, which has been raised by one of the participants, is, uh, is, is, the, is the point of saying, is tech the benchmark of innovation? Or can innovation be uh, measured without the tech element also? Um, and Morgan, if you, if I go to you and talk about a both the constraint and that tech aspect, how would you respond to that? Tech is definitely not required for innovation. It's it's not one of the core ingredients at all. As a tech company, uh, you know, being a tech company for twenty years, I can say this that you know it's not required. You've seen innovations happen without tech. And Radha mentioned the example apartments to My own apartment doesn't mean you've written about us, and Radha. Uh, in terms of recycling. So tech is not required at all. But here's the but, right? If you look at the prime minister's five pillars that he announced two days ago, one of them is technology, right? Uh, so it's really becoming embedded. It's no longer about tech as an addition, right? Uh, it's just the way we live. Uh, it's, it's not something extra. It's not something special you have to build in in order to get funding. But if you really put your problem solving hat on, there is going to be tech somewhere, you know, in a way, in either in scale or the design of the solution itself or WhatsApp, very simple WhatsApp. If you use WhatsApp, you're using tech. If you use Zoom, you're using tech, right? So really think about tech as just another utility, right? Water, electricity, you know, uh, you know, just tech is just one of the utilities that is going to be there. You know, that's not going away. So that's where I will leave it. Yeah. And in terms of uh, Murugan, any specific add-on constraints? I think Anuradha talked a little bit about the mindset and the approach. Would you add on either to that or to any other type of, you know, more um, sort of objective constraints? Or how would you think about it? I, I think, uh, you know, the, the one thing that stands out in the, in, even in the poll question for me is I think talent, right? So if you, if you solve for talent, and if you get the best and brightest to come and solve these difficult problems, then some of the other constraints that are there, funding, partnerships, access, problem understanding, all of that kind of, kind of comes under talent. If you get the best people into the sector early on in their careers, then you know, those guys will figure out how to solve for some of the other constraints. So I would say talent is number one. Okay. Santosh, your perspective? Yeah, I think one of the things that stands out to me and worries me, and this is a call to action, but it's also slightly controversial, is that um, the innovators that we fund, um, you know, are a certain kind. We all talk in a certain way. We have fancy education, and that's the reality. Um, so there's an equity element to it, not the equity financial kind, but the injustice kind, is who are we problem solving problems on behalf of? How many Dalit innovators are we funding? How many people in and off the communities whose lived experiences are different from even among the those in this call, are we really reaching out to? And those that don't speak English and you know can only communicate vernacular. Um, and I think there's a long history of tradition of innovation in this in the country, which is coming out of the grassroots movements. And um, I think the stuff that we're building right now is is somewhat skipping away, skipping, missing out that entire. Uh, ecosystem, I think. And, and and I'm guilty of it. Look, I, I think even at school, you know, if you want to come through the door, you have to speak and act in a certain way. That's the truth, right? I mean, it's unfortunate, but um, and IIT, IM degrees are much more sellable. Harvard would be great. So those are the kinds of things that sell, but that's not truly where change comes from, right? Change comes from people who have lived these experiences and understand these problems better than most people. So I'm actually going to ask Manoj to dwell on that because I think he would have had possibly the greatest experience amongst all of us, at least surely, on the local uh, throughput of innovators and what he's thought he could fund or he could back or he could mentor. So how would Manoj, you react to Santosh's point? I completely agree with what Santosh said. Number one, the whole investment ecosystem is biased towards English speaking, urban, PowerPoint, highly educated, elite education. Absolutely. These are the guys who get funded. right? So one of great innovation that Harish Hande has done in Sanko Founders and he has created a fund and we are, we, we are working together. He has created a fund which actually invests in rural uh, and vernacular speaking micro entrepreneurs working in clean energy space because that's the focus of Sanko Foundation, right? 
uh, this is the first of its kind. And, and I think it's a great experiment and it's a small fund, but it's looking for investing in, uh, in, uh, in entrepreneurs in, in, for example, in Northeast, if somebody is doing uh, energy access business, who is going to invest in that small company, right? So there's a lot of innovation in funding itself. Uh, it's a small fund because not many LPs could actually subscribe to it uh, because it doesn't deliver 30% uh, IRR over five years as most fund investors would expect. But it, it's, it's, it's a great beginning, I would say, identifying the kind of investors Santos just mentioned. Yeah. And if, if this is successful, I think we can again replicate it. Uh, so I think that's a great point. And let, 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 me, let me add one more point. There is one more big problem in, in this whole innovation funding space. Uh, so we, we work you know, with a variety of uh, uh, entrepreneurs and innovators. There is one area which we see like a lot of complex problems cannot be solved without science and technology innovation, right? So there are certain problems. For example, microfinance solved a lot of problems. It was not a great science innovation, right? But if you want like clean energy adoption, you need better batteries, right? If you want to reduce cost of healthcare, you need diagnostic devices. So deep science and technology innovation uh, requires a lot of, lot of money very early stage. And what we see that between the lab, you know, the lab prototype to actual solution in the market, that's where the big, big so-called uh, ubiquitous value of that exists. And we have seen that in almost all deep science and technology startups, who are trying to solve, you know, uh, big, large social problems, they can't really get because by the time they have access to commercial or impact capital is, you know, you have to like, for example, let's take example of healthcare. You have to have go through the clinical validations and, and regulatory approvals before you can access the available capital in the market. Right. So that is an area where we see huge shortage of capital and we're trying to fix that in partnership with some of them. So I'm going to ask you another question, Manoj Kat, bringing in the point that you made earlier, which is that the conversion of lab experiments to, you know, full scale innovation and which requires that entrepreneurship, you, in your perspective, that, that, that conversion is not good enough. And I think all of us will tend to agree to that. And if you think of the constraints that we have discussed, we have discussed the mindset constraint, which Anuradha uh, talked about. We have discussed the finance constraint. We have discussed the fact that, you know, there is a, uh, what should I, affinity bias constraint, which I think Santosh talked about. The same type of people working with same type of people or understanding same type of people. And then we have talked about the fact that tech is no longer, you know, I think the question, do you need tech is a bit of a misnomer question. I mean, one should almost start by saying, why would you not need tech? for anything. So, and, and then there's a the question of what is the right tech. Now, but beyond these constraints from a government or from a industry body, from, you know, organizations which work at large scale in terms of uh, creating, uh, enabling ecosystems, what else is required? What, what would be one or two things that if you had to, let's say, present to the PM, you would ask for? I think one of the most important thing would be to create, like government has already created certain pools of capital, right? Uh, so you actually need pools of capital. This is a large country with several problems and large demand and appetite for capital. So you need more, more, uh, you know, capital pools which are willing to take this long term, uh, extraordinarily high risk. And the second thing is working capital again that you would understand better than anybody else that working capital itself is, a, is an issue in business. And for startups, once they build their solutions and go to market and their revenue just starts coming in, that is when they hit the working capital issues, right? And accessing working capital for startups is a nightmare. So there are, these are the two things, you know, from a funding point of view. From infrastructure point of view, I think as a country, we have done extremely well. We have labs like CCAMP, which are available to life science entrepreneurs. Uh, Social Alpha has built an energy lab in Delhi that's available to any clean energy entrepreneur. And it has, you know, world-class uh, infrastructure for building solutions. Uh, we have worked with IIT Kanpur to build agri incubation network. So infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, lab access uh, is not a big problem in India today. You can actually consolidate across the country and create a virtual uh, access. 
the real real issue is now to create this business incubation uh, infrastructure anyone else or and other than capital i uh, i beg to differ a little bit uh, on on uh, or i would like to dwell a little bit on the um, the hazards maybe of uh, of access to easy capital very early on you know i think there is a lot of capital in the system and and uh, you know from private as well as public uh, players which is available but i think what is really lacking is uh, is the availability of of enough data and and um, a way to estimate uh, the product market fit at a very early stage you know what a lot of times what happens is that you know uh, an idea sounds phenomenal it's it's it takes the fancy of uh, you know uh, governments or investors and and a lot of money is thrown at the idea without even evaluating if it's if if uh the the public or the people for whom it's intended uh it really even wants it in the first place you know or or is it really solving a true problem uh at scale so um i think what's lacking is probably um, an ecosystem that can help uh, a, an innovator evaluate and even fine tune their business model very early on to see if there's a great product market fit and probably you know get real time data to um, to to uh, help you know iterate and see if they can develop a better model that actually solves the problem in a much better way than uh, just access to capital might you know it could it could make the uh, innovator a little more complacent or or um, you know uh, that's that's the view that i have murugan santosh your perspectives I'm sorry, Shantanu. I was so busy answering questions and listening. I lost track of the original question. So the question was: If you had to ask for um, three big things to be solved for, let's say to the government, to the ah, private, right. things that you would ask for. So obviously, uh, Manoj talked about capital. Anuradha talked about product market fit and that data. In in which incidentally is an interesting point because one of the questions that has come up is how important is data in innovation. um and and go ahead murugan you and santosh yeah so i i i actually had the same question in a different format yesterday and i'll give kind of the same answer it's it's hard i want to stay away from it, trying to advise the government because you know i think you know better sometimes no you you're don't. asking the government not advising or asking the government okay <laughs> uh i i <laughs> uh i you know i think uh, manoj dwelled on uh, the, the important point let me just focus on ask of peers right uh, and maybe the government can enable uh, facilitate this as well i think this is not the time for pr brand building or you know uh, working in a close environment if you have assets out there um, that are useful make it available make it open source i think government can also facilitate that by creating these ecosystems like diksha uh, it's also a time for uh, funders to kind of come together and collaborate in collaboratives which is we're also we are seeing that right with uh, the one of the funds that manoj mentioned uh, it's already raised 103 crores as this morning i was reading or importantly they've already disbursed 29 crores and we're still in the middle of the pandemic and they've already disbursed 30% of the funds they raised so i think the from a government it would be to in, you know create an enabling ecosystem for players to come together Uh, would, and and for the players also to collaborate more uh, when it comes to uh, investing in problem solving santosh your perspective um, uh, yeah i mean i i still think there's a huge dearth of funders um and this is not particularly for the government to come and support ecosystem builders um i think the funding community is very excited to uh, support ideas that solutions directly fund organizations but when it comes to people doing the grunt work or at least you know taking the early risk and supporting organizations uh, i i call it as paying for risk um there's a hesitation to do that um i think in the venture ecosystem that's somewhat rewarded because of your you know you invest in 10 early stage companies and one of them goes big bang and you make money um but we don't have a similar kind of mindset in risk taking ability for foundations and private philanthropy to think about it or for the government on the non uh, you know kind of more on the social venture and and the non profit space because i mean I, i mean if you go to any funder or even the government to say hey 9 out of 10 ideas will fail 
everybody will run. But honestly, if you really want true innovation, that's what we need to pay for, right? I mean, right. that's, that's uh, so I think that there's a hesitation to do that. Um, and that's not just in India, it's global, but I think we need to try and change it. I will put that and ask out there. And by the way, that ratio is not unique for the social sector. That ratio is true for the commercial sector. It's just that you, you're paying for dif- you're playing for different trade-offs. That's the that's the only difference there. No, I think the point in com- yeah, I think but for some reason I don't know, Shantanu, the commercial sector seems to be willing to very excitedly back that, right? I mean, the number of venture funds that have come up in India is, is, is yeah, but, large, that, that's but because you're playing for different trade-offs, right? And which is yeah. what I think Manoj was talking a little bit about that, you know the the delta on payoffs is not large enough to take that unless you introduce a third element to that whole equation. Um, and it will never happen on that basis. Uh, let me just pause and see Priya, if we have the results of that poll. Priya, yes, hi. Uh, Naman, uh, can you share the poll results? Okay, I can share it. That's fine. Okay. Can you see the results? No, I think this was the first oh, one. The first one. Okay, one second. Uh, yeah, this is the one. Yeah. So this is an interesting one because we have, I think, spent most of our time discussing funding. funding and yes. what people are saying is problem understanding. So maybe we, since we have 10 minutes left, uh, let's go to problem understanding. Um, and Manoj, since, since you seem to be in violent agreement with it, why don't you go ahead and talk about your, your perspective of yeah. problem understanding? This is, as a, yeah, this, this, is, this is where we started the conversation, right? So it's, it's extremely important, and just to add to what Anuradha and Santos both mentioned, it is extremely important to establish problem statements and curate what problems we are trying to solve very early, right? Uh, and then the whole problem of establishing product market fit later gets taken care of. So product, mar- in, in, especially in this social innovation space, we cannot wait for testing the product market fit after investing in the innovation. So you, how do you manage that risk? You manage that risk by curating testing problem statements with multiple stakeholders very early in the game, right? And, and understanding of problem statement, validating it with a large number of players across, you know, sectors is extremely important when you search for these innovators and entrepreneurs for funding them. And that, that risk management is, it has to happen very early. A lot of times we see, uh, you know, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs uh, where they have built actually the solution and we ask them uh, during our due diligence and evaluation, so what's your go-to-market strategy? And in, I would say seven to eight out of 10 cases, the answer is we will hire a sales team and they will take care of this. So, so that's too late. Santosh, is, is that common across the world? Do you see a problem understanding or problem statement being one of the big constraints of innovation or, or incorrectly framing it or not giving it enough thought and time? Yeah, I don't think it's, um, it, it's, uh, I mean, I'll be honest, it's a, it's an unsexy thing, right? Because it's hard to fund. So we don't talk about it as, as fund- funders. And also it relates back to my previous point, which is around equity. Um, you know, the folks who don't have understanding the problems, challenges understanding the problems are actually people who are living the problems, right? I mean, if you, if you are a domestic worker uh, and, and you're trying to, you understand what the realities are, or if you're living on a, a bare minimum of social protection. Um, so that's the, that's the power of having voices that needs to be included in decision-making and solving is that the more inclusive we are, the more we are going to get closer to understanding these problems, because then the voices of people who live these problems can be brought to forefront. And I, I'm, I'm really glad to see that as, as, as a coming, as a solution. That's, I mean, I, I think that it, the reflection that I have is the fact that this is a huge challenge is also an indicator that it's a call to action for us to say, how do we bring more diverse voices in? Not just as entrepreneurs, but even as employees, even as folks who can build, you know, the first few people you hire may be people who have lived experiences that are closer to the problems. So that, and, and this is not true. I mean, this is true across the world. I think India has a fairly strong local ecosystem. But if you look at another big market which you work in in Africa, there's a lot of folks that are coming from the outside trying to solve problems for people in that continent, right? Um, so expert entrepreneurs is very common. Um, and that again is 
the same issue. You don't understand the context at all. You're trying to build something for people you don't fully understand, and then you're bound to fail. So well said, so, Santos. Thank you for we, saying that. <laughs> so we've got about seven to eight minutes left, and I want to actually finish with an invitation to all of you to talk on two aspects. One is we talk a little bit about talent, and and therefore, how do you think we'll get better talent to solve um, the social innovation and the social problem statements and focus on that. That's one. And the second is, if you just look at it from a longitudinal basis and you just reflect it on, on the last five years, would you say that there's uh, progress in the right direction and it's accelerating or do you think that it's sort of a sideways drift or is this actually negative from an innovation ecosystem perspective? So we should end with our collective view on where that is going. So uh, Murugan, why don't you go ahead and maybe just a minute and a half each so that we can cover that. Sure. So I think um, we the ecosystem is what's going to help bring talent. Right? And today we have an ecosystem that is dramatically better than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, I don't think this is possible 10 years ago. We were talking about social ventures, nonprofit startups. And we have seen having incubated about 35 uh, startups. Um, the quality of talent that we're getting is just mind boggling. Uh, every cohort gets an application. The first one got a thousand plus applications. Even the third one got 500 plus, right? So, and it just keeps happening. And sure, Manoj is seeing the quality of talent continues to go up. And we have actually mapped, you know, whether they are PhDs or, you know, foreign degree holders or high school dropouts. We have that whole pie chart you know, ready with us. Um, and it is a good broad spectrum of people who do understand the problem. Uh, of course, it does have the expat entrepreneurs and others as well. So I think the ecosystem is uh, what's going to help enable bring better quality talent. If we can make it, like Shantosh said, equivalent to the commercial ecosystem, uh, then I think we will get talent regardless uh, of whether it is nonprofit, social problems, or for profit. Right? I will leave it with this in terms of. Uh, perspective on you know uh, what we see going forward. We have a raging pandemic today, right? Uh, the worst the world has ever seen, and billions are going about their lives near normal. Right? Uh, so the world is a much better place today than it has ever been before, and that is a fact. Uh, all kinds of data will show you that. At the same time, we have hundreds of millions of migrant laborers and refugees, and you know people below the poverty line, really, really struggling. So the world. It's a much better place than ever before, but it's also quite an awful place for lots of people in the world. And hence, the world can be much better. The only way the world can be much better is how we've gotten to this point, which is innovating our way out into a better place. So I'll just leave it with that and uh, as my closing thought. Great, great point. Why, would, why don't the others add on to that before we close? Yeah, I completely agree with Morgan in the sense uh, that the uh, world is a much better place than, you know, especially for social innovation than it probably was five to 10 years earlier uh, with respect to, you know, access to funding, with respect to, you know, um, people being able to communicate what they do to a really large, massive audience. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, whatever we think of tech, but tech has been the biggest enabler in, in uh, taking innovations far and wide and, and being able to help uh, people access them in various different ways. Um, right. So uh, you, you spoke about talent as well. So I will just, uh, you know, touch upon that Shantanu a little bit because talent, uh, you know, we, we nowadays hear of so many well-funded uh, nonprofits who are able to get access to great pools of talent, right? Even, even to, you know, at a corporate level, you know, they're able to pay corporate level strategy uh, salaries and they're able to attract the best talent to come and work in the development sector. Uh, but we often ignore the fact that a large number of organizations, especially the ones who are working on grassroots innovations and things like that, uh, cannot and do not have access to such talent. They will probably never have access to such talent. You know, I know of several innovations, innovators that we have covered who live in small villages and who continuously, uh, you know, tell, talk to us, complain about the fact that, you know, in spite of the immense 
uh, you know, response they got from our articles and so many hundreds and thousands of people reached out to them. Uh, so many people want to volunteer, but nobody really wants to come and live in those kind of conditions or those kind of places, right? So uh, attracting talent for a whole lot of uh, rural innovation, innovators, social entrepreneurs, um, you know, and, and people who do not have access to, to large pools of funding still remains a huge challenge in the, so in the development sector. And um, I don't see that going away anytime soon. So I think the only way to kind of I think tech will probably play another very important role there, uh, you know, where we're able to use, you know, how we're able to communicate now using Zoom and WhatsApp and everything. Um, and, and with the entire digital push in, in the country, uh, we will hopefully see a lot of people being able to attract talent that can work remotely and be able to carry out the, the functions that were needed you know, uh, for people to come there, whether it's helping the small NGOs or the small entrepreneurs, uh, you know, market their products or, you know, uh, develop a small sales team to kind of take them to market or a small, uh, you know, develop business development team or whatever the talent that they need, they're not able to tap into uh, in their own uh, local uh, or hyper local uh, areas, they should probably hopefully be able to tap into, uh, you know, when they're able to reach a global audience, not just India. So I'm ho hoping that will play a huge enabler there. But at present, it's still a challenge. Terrific. So I think we are running out of time. Um, you know, it's interesting that at the beginning of this, we thought we don't know what we're going to do for one and a half hours. And I suspect we can go <laughs> the one hours on, on a topic, which obviously is very close to all our heart. And there's a bunch of questions which are coming on. So I just want to thank um, a firstly, the panelists for, for, you know, joining in and being active. Santosh, you are almost at midnight. So thank you for, for staying up. Hopefully we didn't bore you enough to doze off as you had threatened. Uh, but everyone else and thanks Priya for pulling this together and thanks for the hundreds of participants who came in and, and uh, listened to this and I'm sure there's a way that you are all going to communicate back to us. I think the summary of everything that we said is um, if, you, if there's one takeaway from this whole conversation, I think you should take away a, a, an underlying current of optimism um, for innovation and for what it can do for the social sector. So with that Priya, I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shantanu, for pulling in such an interesting panel together. And for all the panelists, uh, it's been amazing to hear your views. And I know that a lot of you had made comments which are very, which show your vulnerability and you have really uh, had very open conversations. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I think one of the biggest thing that we at the Nudge Center for Social Innovation focus on is how do we make it easy? How do we reduce the friction? for anybody who wants to come in into the sector and problem solve. And we all play uh, a role there. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, with the social consciousness at such a high, uh, we will be able to get more people interested in thinking about social problems and solving for them. Um, for the audience, thank you so much for participating and some really great questions. Uh, I will, uh, this, uh, uh, a recording will be available on YouTube for people to watch later. We will also post in the recordings of the earlier uh, ones. I am staying on um, for the next half an hour. The next session is with uh, Sanjay Purohit, where he will talk about a lot of things that you guys talked about, building models of replication, building open ecosystem. And uh, that is the topic for the next panel, which is also the second enabler that we had in mind of how do we enable rapid um, innovations in the system. Uh, so uh, please stay on or join in. I'm here if you want to ask more questions um, and have suggestions to have conversations. And thank okay. you again for the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, so great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Thank you so much for having us.